go right into the word. I'm going to pray. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Our Father and our God, we thank you once again for allowing us to be here, Lord, gather together, Lord, assembling ourselves, Lord, and uh, for the edifying of the body of Christ, Lord, and to worship you on your holy day. Lord, we thank you for this beautiful Sabbath, Lord. We thank you for the Sabbath that you have given us, Lord, because you have made it for us, Lord, to, to take part in communication and relationship with you and to worship you as our creator and our redeemer. So, Lord, we thank you, we praise you, and we magnify your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank God. Amen. Amen. So the title of my uh, topic, if, uh, if you will, is the will of God, an attitude of gratitude. The will of God, an attitude of gratitude. Uh, and, and where I got that is from two scriptures mainly, uh, Ephesians 5 and 17 and it says, therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Okay? So this is Paul talking to the church in Ephesus. He's saying, don't be unwise, but understand what, this, what, you know, what the will of the Lord is. And the next logical question is, well, what is the will of God? Well, go to 1 Thessalonians 5 and 18. It says, in everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you, okay? And so let's just break down, okay, so will. You know, what does will mean, okay? Well, will in the Greek actually means thelema, okay? And thelema meaning it is a determination, properly the thing that is actively the choice, specifically purpose or decree, Abstractly, volition, or passively, the inclination, desire, pleasure, or will, okay? And to even break that down even further, thelema comes from the, the root word thelo or athelo, okay? And what that means is other, uh, the, to determine as an active voice or opinion from a subjective impulse, Okay? Properly denotes rather a passive voice or acquiescence and objective considerations that is choose or to prefer, literally or figuratively, by implication to wish. So God's wish, because remember, God doesn't force anybody, right? So he's saying, my wish for you is to give thanks in everything because that is my wish or my preference for you, okay? Let's break that down even further, okay? So what is thanks? What is giving thanks? So giving thanks is, uh, actually comes from the Greek word eucharisto, okay? Euch I'm sorry, eucharisteo. I'm going to make sure I pronounce it properly. Eucharisteo, and it means to be grateful. That is actually to express gratitude towards something. So specifically, to say grace at a meal, or to give, or to be thankful, or to give thanks, Sister Teresa. So when you break that down even further, because you know I'm a chemist, I like to break things down to its, you know, its elemental form, right? That comes from Eucharistos, which is well-favored. That is, by implication, to be grateful or thankful, okay? And then that is further broken down into two words, and the first one is you, meaning it's a good or adverbially well or good. And then the other word is charizome, uh, meaning to grant as a favor that is gratuitously in kindness, pardon, or rescue to deliver, frankly, to forgive, to freely forgive, or to grant or to give, okay? And then, again, see, I'd, I'd like to break stuff down even further. So, you, so uh, karizome is broken down into karis. Karis means to be gracious or graciousness or as gratifying, a manner or act, abstract or concrete, uh, literal or figurative or even spiritual, especially the divine influence upon the heart. 
and its reflection in the life, including gratitude, acceptable benefit, favor, gift, or grace, joy, liberality, pleasure, or thankfulness. Okay? And then, breaks it down even further, goes to another word called kario. Kario, now remember that one. Kario means to be full of cheer. So when he's saying give thanks, you need to be full of cheer, okay? That is calmly happy or well-off, impersonal, especially as a salutation, meeting on meeting or parting. So, you know, when you meet somebody, you should be cheerful. When you say goodbye to them, you should be cheerful, okay? Farewell, be glad, Godspeed, or hail, joyful, or to rejoice, now, during those times, uh, you know, it, it, was, it was easy, and even to these, you know, to now, to, to present day, it's easy to be grateful and to be joyful when things are going your way. You know, I mean, once you get your paycheck, I know I got my paycheck yesterday, you know, I mean, you, I mean, uh, pay Friday, you know, oh, happy Friday, because it's a pay Friday, you know what I mean, you, you know, but what about the off days, you know, or what about when that one coworker is getting on your nerves? You need to be grateful. Be grateful, yes, and I'll show you, you know, why you should be grateful, okay? But, you know, uh, 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 and even sometimes, you know, people take, uh, if you will, a supplement to be grateful. You know, some people, you know, they drink wine or they, you know, or, you know, I know some of y'all don't do that here, but, you know, they drink wine or they smoke the medicinal or the, you know, the, the ganja, and they, and they have a false sense of being grateful or being cheerful, or being happy, right? But see, what the Bible says in Ephesians 5 and 18, it says, and do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. So in other words, we are to be filled with the Holy Spirit instead of unholy spirits. You know how when you go to the, to, to the liquor store and they say, oh, you know, liquor, spirits, and wine? Yes, you know, because they believe back in the day if you drunk that stuff, you were possessed by spirits. So what Paul is saying here is to be not, to, 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 to not be drunk with wine and, 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 you know, smoking that stuff, but to be filled with the spirit. We are supposed to be filled with the Spirit, and when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, it is only with the Holy Spirit that we are sincere with our worship and our praise. Jesus shows us this in the parable in Luke. When you go to Luke 18 and 9, he says, and also he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one was a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. And the Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector here. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Doesn't that sound pompous? Doesn't that sound arrogant? I, you, know, I, you know, I give all of my offering. I give to the pathfinders and to the adventurers and when the children have the buckets out every Sabbath, I give. I'm the one that gives the $50 bill in there, you know. You know? But then the tax collector, you know, and, you know, back in those days, tax collectors, another word for tax collector was like a corporate thief, you know, a one that actually would get away with, you know, stealing from the people. You know, tax collectors weren't highly looked upon, you know, especially around tax season. You know, I know around tax season, the, the IRS, people don't like the IRS doing around tax season, you know, because most of the time they got to pay back something that they kept all year, right? But the tax collector had a totally different approach when he went to the Lord. You know, he standing afar off, so he didn't even come into the sanctuary, if you will, okay? Imagine a tax collector standing way back where um, Brother Edwards is staying, uh, back there in the vestibule. He's, uh, he's back there in the vestibule. Didn't even feel worthy coming into the sanctuary. And he said, would, wouldn't, even, wouldn't even raise his eyes, you know, to heaven, but beat his chest saying, God, 
be merciful to me, a sinner. He recognized that in my flesh dwelleth no good thing. Jack supposed to the church member, you know, that was, ooh, I thank thee. He said that false sense of gratitude. And he wasn't thankful to God. He was thankful for himself. He was thankful that, oh, oh you, know, I, you know, I give money, you know. And at the end of time, you know, there are going to be a group of people that, Lord, haven't we cast demons out of your name? Haven't we, you know, uh, 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 fed the hungry and, and, and clothed the disenfranchised? And Jesus is going to tell them, depart from me. I never knew you. You know? So, so, so he says here, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Then Jesus tells them, he says, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. No wonder Jesus taught his disciples on the Sermon of the Mount, blessed, which is Cairo, blessed or happy or cheerful or grateful are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst, here's the key, after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart. And the only way you can be pure in heart is if you ask the Lord to take out that stony heart, that heart that cannot be, and give me the heart of flesh so that I can feel something, so I can feel the gratitude, so that way I can come into the knowledge that I was once dead and now I am alive. So he's saying, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall do what? See God. You cannot see God unless your heart, Sister Jones, is pure. And the only way you can have a pure heart is what, Elder Bowman? Taking the heart of flesh, the heart that God gives you. Blessed, now here's my favorite one. Blessed are those, I'm sorry, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Now you got to ask yourself, am I, am I promoting peace? wherever I go, because also Paul says that, that your, your, your feet should be shod with the gospel of peace, right? Beautiful are the feet of them that bring the gospel, because the gospel is to do what? Bring peace. So if I'm, if I'm a so-called Christian and everywhere I go, I'm sowing discord, everywhere I'm causing chaos, then I got to think that I'm not a peacemaker. You know what I'm saying? I'm not a peacemaker. And then, therefore, I'm not a son of God. Amen? Amen. 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 So he says here, blessed are you when they revile you, when they persecute you, and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. And here he says, rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So you see here, the Pharisee is the church member, while the tax collector, viewed by society, is superficially viewed as a thief. Yet Jesus said that the tax collector went to the Lord in the right spirit. He went to the Lord in the right spirit. So going back to Ephesians 5 and now verse 19, Paul saying, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, what does he mean when he says giving thanks always for all things? Well, Sister Chelsea, 
when she was given the, the, uh, the lesson to the lambs, she said that what do we need to be thankful for? Not just for the good stuff, but also for the not so good stuff, right? Because just like in her beautiful analogy, she talked about how the, the, the person had the bald tire. And she, and I, and I guess the person had a flat tire, right? And the fact that she was like, Lord, why did you give me a, a, a flat tire? Well, or, or a bald tire. And the fact is, is that because if they didn't get that flat tire or that bald tire and they went on their journey without the spare tire, the tire could have blown. So it could have, you know, exacerbated or, or made it worse. You know what I mean? It, uh, it could have, uh, they could have been stranded like on Route 66 with the next gas station or the next uh, 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 rest station five, six, seven miles down the road with no service. So the Lord allowed them to have that bald tire then to protect them from a greater tragedy down the road, right? Let me give you an example. Let me give you an example of how we are supposed to be thankful in spite of the individual's circumstance. The first example is Brother David. Brother David, uh, right around second, 1 Samuel 21 and 10, now this, now this happened, now, well, let's, let's, let's read it. It says, then David arose and fled that day from before Saul and went to Achish, the king of Gath. Now, to give you context, now, this, now what happened here is that David had just got done slewing Goliath, okay? Slaying, sorry, forgive me, slaying Goliath. Thank you. Thank you. Keep me straight. Iron sharp and iron now. He slayed or slew Goliath, right? And so what he had done is he had cut off his head and he had placed his head, you know, in the midst of the people. And that was a sign saying, look, I'm coming for the rest of y'all too. Anybody who defiles or defies the God of Israel, right? And so when he had done this, his popularity had grew. And Saul, the king, had become jealous of that, right? And so David, still respecting Saul's position and Saul's anointing, he fled from the presence of Saul. And look at this. He ran to the very city that Goliath is from. Yeah, he ran to the very city that Goliath is from. And he found himself in the hands of Achish, the king of Gath. Okay? And so... Uh, uh, in uh, verse 11 of 1 Samuel 21, it says, And the servants of Achish said to him, Is not this David the king of the land? Now, pause for a second. Now, he wasn't the king yet. He wasn't the king yet because Saul was still alive, right? But they recognized his authority. They recognized that the Lord was with him. How do we know that? Did they not sing to him to one another in dances, saying, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands? Now, pause again. Where else did we hear that before? From one can chase a thousand and two can put ten thousand to flight. So why is it that Saul chased or uh, killed one thousand and David killed two thousand? It's because the Lord was with him. And the Lord wasn't with Saul, remember? He moved his anointing from Saul to David. So, so right there. Okay, back to the story. So now in verse 12, it says, Now David took these words to heart. Now, so even though David fled to this, to this uh, uh, foreign uh, Philistine city after he defeated one of the greatest Philistine champions, or Philistine champions, Goliath, Brother Marvin, you see here that his popularity had even grew to the neighboring nations, okay? So when you are standing for the Lord and for his righteousness, the influence is going to travel, okay? And he got afraid of that. David got afraid of that. So what did David do? He changed his behavior before him, and he played or he pretended to be madness in their hands and scratched on doors of the gate 
and he allowed the saliva to fall down from his beard. So, you know, like in those cartoons you saw, like the, like the dogs and stuff, when they were there mad, they started, you know, salivating and stuff like that. And, you know, he was, he was playing like he was insane. And so, uh, 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 after that, then the king said unto his servants, Lo, ye see this man is mad. Wherefore, then have ye brought him to me? Have I need for madmen? that ye have brought this fellow to play the madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? David therefore departed thence and escaped to the cave Aldalim. And when his brethren and all his father's house heard it, they went down thither to him. Okay? And then the psalm that's connected to this story is Psalm 34 and 1. And it says that a psalm of David, when he changed his behavior before Abimelech, who drove him away and departed, this is what I like, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. So you got to think, while David was playing the, the, the madman, he was blessing the Lord. Now, he wasn't mad now, okay? He was, but, he, but in the midst of his situation, he was praising the Lord. So that goes back to what Paul was saying. Give thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here we, say, here we see David, a man after God's own heart, in the will of, the God, of, of God by, stated, by stating that the fact that during the good times I will bless the Lord. Even during the bad times in which he was fleeing from Saul, as a matter of fact, the Andrews Bible commentary states that David hoped that the people in the city would not recognize him. So at first, he was trying to appear as a mercenary soldier, but that plan failed. So as news had reached all the way to that area, because he was recognized, he tried to play crazy. And when he was blessing the Lord, it confused the enemy. It confused the enemy because he was like, wait a minute, this is the guy you said that, that, that defeated our champion? Get, you know, get him out of here. He, he crazy. He's sitting there praising God, you know. So even in that situation, we should always give God praise, even when the situations are dire and extreme. We should still give God praise. During times of persecution, we should we shall bless the Lord. And you know what? Out of the mouths of two or three witnesses, right? Let, uh, let, let his word be established, right? I got another witness. Let's go to Job. Remember in, in Job chapter 1 when the, when the servants came and told Job, hey, Job, all your cattle, all your oxen, as a matter of fact, your children are, are dead. And I was the only one that, 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 that escaped to tell you this tale. What did Job do? What did Job do? Job 1 and 20 says, Then Job arose, tore his robe, shaved his head, bald like me, shaved his head, and he fell to the ground, and he worshipped, and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. And by the way, you know what Job means? Job in the Hebrew, so we as English speakers, well, mainly English speakers, we, it's, it's a transliteration, Job. But actually in Hebrew, it means Job. And it actually means hated or persecuted, okay? So you see here in all the book of Job that the enemy was persecuting him because he was a perfect and upright man, right? And then remember, in the beginning of the book, Satan accused Job of only worshiping God or having an attitude of gratitude about God because he was blessed of God. He had all this stuff, you know? But in... This account, we see that even in his suffering of major loss, he gave glory 
and honor to God. And because of his response, the Bible reads, in his worshiping of the Lord, he did not sin nor charge God for his calamity. No wonder why the apostle Paul writes to the church in Philippians 4 and 4, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. And then later on in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 17, he says, pray without ceasing. Because when we take on these characteristics, we take on the mind of Christ. And Christ said in John 8 and 29, and he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, for I do always those things that please him. All right? So basically what I'm trying to say here, people of God, is that when we are always praying without ceasing, when we're always rejoicing in all of our calamities, when things are going good, when things are going bad, Sister Jeanette, that you will find yourself not sinning. You'll find yourself not sinning. Why? Because if you're constantly got your mind stayed on Christ, yeah. there is no sin yeah. because he did not sin. So if I have the mind of Christ, then therefore I will flee from sin. Amen. All right? So later on in the Gospel of John, when Jesus prayed to the Father about the resurrection of Lazarus, how did Jesus pray? Did he say, Lord, please let, look, raise up Lazarus so I can show these people? Did he say that? No. It says, he says in John 11 and 41, then, he took, then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, here's the key. Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me, and I knew that thou hearest me always, because, but because of the people which, which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. So all, at all times, brothers and sisters, Thank the Lord, but also in all and for all things, we should have an attitude of gratitude. Again, Paul in Ephesians, now verse 25 and 20, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why do you think Paul writes always for all things? When we go to Romans chapter 8 and 27 and 28, Paul, by his administrative assistant, Tortillas, that's why we need our administrative assistant. So thank God for our administrative assistants, Sister Diane Jones, Brother Edwards, and Sister Corinne. Thank you. Because it says here, it says, Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the what? The will of God. And what is the, and, and, and then it says, and we know that all things, this is why we thank God for all things, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. What is his purpose? His will, his, his, his preference. Right? And what is his will? That goes, it goes back that when all things we give thanks. Right? And also when we go back to the Old Testament, because you know I like going back and forth, right? Because it all messes together when you read it right. It all messes together. The wisest man other than Jesus, whoever lived, King Solomon, a.k.a. Jedediah, says in Ecclesiastes 2 and 24, nothing is better for a man then, then that he should eat and drink and that his soul should enjoy good in his labor. This also I saw was from the hand of God. And then later on, the next chapter, in chapter 3, verse 12, he says, I know that nothing is better for them to rejoice and to do good in their lives. Now, this is a man who has seen it all and done it all. There was a rapper uh, a few years ago named Shorty Lowe. He was like, they call me Dun Dun. Then done it all. 
expensive cars, then drove them all. Well, you ain't, nah. Solomon has then done it all. He's, he's had the women, he's had the cars, he's had the chariots, he's had the gold, the silver. And what does he say? He says that all of that is vanity. It is nothing more or better for them to rejoice and to do good in all their lives. And then later on he says, and also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of all his labors. It is the gift of God. Now, he's saying rejoice in the good while you are laboring, not after you labor. So when you go to your job, uh-oh, when you go to your job, you're supposed to rejoice in your job. Yes, I know that that, 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 that supervisor gets on your nerves. You, I mean, why do you always pick on me? Well, because you are a child of God. In this world, you're going to have tribulation. But Jesus said, fear not, Brother Dan. Why? Because I have overcome the world. So he's saying here that in uh, uh, Solomon say in verse 15, he says that which has already been. Oh, let me back up. Let me back up. Verse 14, it says, I know that whatever God does, it shall be forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing can be taken from it. So in other words, it's perfect. Whatever God does is eternal and it's perfect. You can't add to it. And we talked about that last Sabbath, right? Because when you add to it, when you add to something that's perfect, it becomes corrupt. And when you take away from something that's perfect, it becomes incomplete or imperfect, right? So you're not supposed to add to it or take it away, okay? God does it that men should fear before him. That which has already been and what has to be, ha I'm sorry, and what is to be has already been, and God requires an account of what is past. So later in the New Testament, Jesus teaches his disciples based on uh, uh, what, no, what we just read and what we just learned that, you know, it is better for us to what? To eat and drink and to rejoice in our labors. Don't, don't, re don't, re don't find yourself just collecting a whole bunch of stuff, but just rejoice in, in what you're doing. Be in the present. Don't be in the past and don't worry about the future. I'll prove it to you. In Matthew 6 and 9, uh, uh, um, Jesus says, therefore, I'm sorry, Matthew 6 and, 25, uh, 6 and 25, it says, Jesus says, Therefore I say unto you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not your life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds in the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to your stature? So why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field and how they grow. Neither, they neither toil nor spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now pause for a second. So when I read that, that passage, I was like, okay, so what, what, what's he talking about? Because, I mean, Solomon, again, we just read Solomon. He didn't done it all, right? He didn't have the most expensive clothes and stuff like that, right? Here's what the Spirit told me. He said, look up what a lily looks like. When I looked up what a lily looks like, you, and, and do this when you go home, if you, if you choose to. You see all the different colors of a lily, and guess what? It's natural. It's natural to them. See, somebody had to get all those colors to make his raiment, to make it a, a certain purple. You, matter of fact, they said back in those days you could only get like a certain uh, purple was the color of royalty because it was so expensive to get. You could, you could only get it from like this oyster or from this, this certain place in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the Mediterranean Sea, whereas God had put it in the lily, you know? So, so, so that's why Jesus is saying that, that, that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, 
Will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So, 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 what is Jesus saying? Well, if you go back again in chapter 6, when he's teaching the disciples how to pray, he's saying, in this manner, therefore pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Or, in other words, hallelujah. That's what that means. Yeah. Hallelujah means hallowed Jah's name. That's what that means. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will, uh-oh, your will, your will be done. What is his will? In all things. Give thanks, which is, your, which is the will of God concerning you. So listen, God's will is for you to be happy. That's what thanksgiving is. It's for you to be happy. Your will be done on earth as it already is in heaven. Give us yesterday. Give us two weeks from now. Give us two years from now. This day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do, to, and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from all evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So, and I see, so, so when Jesus is telling us not to be anxious, just worry about today. Worry about what you can control. You know what? As I was uh, driving uh, home yesterday uh, after picking up uh, my son 3J, uh, one of the uh, church, uh, 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 you know, one of those bulletins, no, I'm sorry, it wasn't a church bulletin. It was a, uh, it was a school bulletin. And it said the only thing that the only person that you can control is yourself. And I was like, man, I was like, man, if God ain't showing me just, you know, I'm, mm, God is a good God. So, so, so later on he says, therefore do not worry, saying what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For after all these things the Gentiles seek. Or in other words, the heathen, the unbeliever seeks, okay? The unbeliever seeks to get riches, seeks to get, you know, money and all that stuff. As a matter of fact, I, I, I can't remember which, which, which Rockefeller said this, but uh, they asked him, they was like, well, how much is enough? And you know what he said? He said, one more dollar. One more dollar. So, so in other words, he's saying enough ain't enough. Wow. But Jesus is saying the exact opposite. For after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Amen. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So, Paul actually uh, explains this even further, and he's saying in Philippians 4 and 6, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, uh -oh, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God, which is what we did, right, in intercessory prayer. We asked, if, what, what are your requests? And be made known. And not only that, because I know that some of you guys are suffering. I know that some of you all are suffering not just for yourselves, but for your family members, for your friends. But also, give thanks. Why? Because you have the mind to want to lift up your brother and your sister in prayer. Because remember, at one time, you were out there in the world. And somebody uh, had you on their mind and took the time to pray for you. Amen? So, therefore, he's saying, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. Going back to what David said, I will bless the Lord at all times. And his praises shall continually be in my mouth. Will guard your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. Remember, Job was worshiping, and because he worshiped, he did not sin, right? So, he's saying that, therefore, finally, and I'm closing, finally, Brethren, whatever things are true, 
whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are good of good report, if there is any virtue, if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Amen. 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 And I am through. So basically what I'm saying here is that, well, I, I mean, I, I can't even say, uh, listen, just in all things, be grateful. Be grateful. Thank God for those trials and tribulations. Why? Because he's right there with you. He's, he, was the, he was there with you before you went into the trial. He's there with you while you're in the trial. And he will be there with you when he pulls you out of that trial. Amen. And thank him in the good things and thank him in the not so good things. Why? Because this is his will, you know. Now, his will wasn't for us to fall away from him. Remember, in, 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 in the Garden of Eden, he wanted us to work but to enjoy it. Actually, I wasn't even called work then. It was called dressing and tending. It wasn't work then. It was only called work until after sin. But even in the midst of that, 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 that command that the Lord gave Adam and Eve, that, that thou shalt work by the sweat of your brow, that still, still give thanks because he cursed the ground for their sakes. Yes, he cursed the ground for their sakes. Why? So that way they would always remember that we need Christ and not the other way around, you know? And so let's not be like that Pharisee that Jesus talked about in having that insincere gratitude. I thank God that, uh, that you know, I got, you know, I got all my affairs in order and all my bills are paid. Well, thank God for that, you know, but thank God for the means that you got. And who gave you those means, right? You're right. Just like, uh, just like, uh, like Jonah. Remember Jonah after he had preached in Nineveh and, 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 and. The, and the Lord gave him an object lesson, right, when he made that, that, that shade for him. And he was praising God for the shade. No, he was praising for the shade. He wasn't praising God. He was praising. He was, oh, yes, I got shade. Because he was trying to watch the city, Nineveh, be destroyed. And the Lord still, even though the Lord knew his heart, he provided shade for him. And then the very next day, the worms came and ate it up. And then God asked him, you have a right to be angry? Because you didn't make that, that, that branch, nor did, nor did the branch, did, nor did you have anything to do with the branch going away. But you have more sympathy for that branch than the people. And then, and then in the Sabbath school lesson a couple of Sabbaths ago, he said that you were even grateful for the thing, but not the person that gave you the thing. So what does that say about us? We need to be grateful, not for the stuff, but for the person who had us on his mind. Oh, come on now. Brother Wobash, he had you on his mind. An infinite God who created the heavens and the earth, meaning he's bigger than the heavens and the earth. And on this day, Brother, uh, uh, Brother Mervin, he had you on his mind. Now, that's mind-boggling in itself. So, as we're all standing, as we're all standing, let us remember to give thanks with a grateful heart. 